All right, well, it's seven o'clock, so we're gonna get going. And um, I'm gonna introduce the team that's with you tonight. I'm Marcy Larson. I'm the VP of Marketing and Communications here at the museum. And I will be uh, do being, doing the logistics of this session with my associate and colleague, Michelle Gatesy, who continues to let people in. Um, we will also be, I welcome our moderator, Gail Dallas, and I'll tell you just a bit about her in a second. Um, the way this will work is we're going to start off the session asking you to participate via the chat. And then after that, once we get going, we want to hear from you. So please, we encourage you to put your cameras on. And if you have something to say, you can raise your hand or in even preferably use the um, the 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 capability at the bottom of your screen that says reactions and that if you click up on that you can see that you can raise your hand as well when you do that you pop to the top of the participant mm -hmm. list and we know you're trying to talk with us or have a comment um, sometimes depending how many people are on the zoom we don't see everyone's faces so when you raise your hand it's harder to see you um, with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight, and that um, we welcome Gail Dallas. And Gail wears many, many hats in her professional and personal life. She's a group dialogue facilitator and a mediator and a conflict coach. She's also a professional education trainer and facilitator with particular experience in training Holocaust history educators and educators and students in law enforcement in recognizing and combating bias, such an important topic in today's world. She's been a docent at the museum for several years and recently became a moderator and skills trainer for Braver Angels, a national grassroots organization which brings Americans together to depolarize politics. So welcome, Gail. We're excited to have you lead our discussion of WITNESS um, lessons from Ellie Wiesel's classroom, written by Ariel Berger. So, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you. And I probably need to unmute you, or you need to unmute yourself. That is expression for 2020, right? You're muted. <laughs> Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, I love talking about books, so I'm really excited to be here tonight with all of you to talk about this book. Um, I'm probably going to have to curate my thoughts because I could I could potentially have a discussion with people for two hours about this. And there are a lot of, um, I've broken it down sort of thematically in ways that I think it might help us to approach this book. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping we get to all that. I'm not sure that we will. And uh, so if occasionally you see me look away for the screen, it's because I'm looking up some quote. It took me forever to read this book only because I was taking notes and constantly writing down like little gems and nuggets of wisdom from Ellie Wiesel. I see a number of faces nodding, right? It was, it was so great to really experience those nuggets. And I got a lot out of the book for that. Um, it made me realize, gosh, I was in the Boston area in the early 80s. Why didn't I take a course with him? And I'm, I'm kicking myself about that. So let's dive in. We're going to do a deep dive into the book. Let's dive in right now. I would like to start, and we're just going to take maybe a minute to do this. Um, uh, I would have done it before I read the book. This is how I like to kick off discussions, but it's very Ellie Wiesel-esque, where Ellie Wiesel might have opened up a, uh, a, a class lecture or a day in the class by saying, what are your questions? I'm going to tweak that a little bit. Um, so I'm not, I'm not throwing out to the group, what are your questions, but what are your feelings? And if you want to just in one or two words, throw into the chat, what feelings came up for you when you read this book or when you finished this book? And, and don't overthink it. If you don't have anything great, but if you do throw it, throw that, we're going to ask you to unmute and talk it um, mostly for this conversation, but just to get a lot of feelings out there, throw it into the chat. One or, one or two words that came up. And I can't tell if anything's, ah. Oh. Um, okay, I'm starting to see them. I'm going to read them off. I have Ashley saying she was inspired. 
Someone else? Great, thank you. What what else? I, and, and no pressure. If you don't, if there wasn't isn't anything, we'll give you maybe another 20 seconds or so. One or two feelings that either while you were reading the book or when you were through with it that came up for you. I didn't want the book to end. I wanted to go back to school. I was in awe. Great, thank you. Anyone else? We'll give you a few more seconds. Anybody else? Thought provoking. I desire to learn with greater depth. Profoundly moved by the wisdom. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you, everybody. And yes, 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 and yes, right? It was inspiring. It was thought provoking. Many of us might have felt like we were in awe, really moved by the wisdom. Um, so, so, all of that, right? All of that. So, what I'd like to start out to throw out to all of us is. Um, <sighs> Elie Wiesel was so, uh, he was a storyteller, right? And storytelling was such a part of his teaching. And I think if we didn't have a sense of that before reading this book, we definitely got a sense of how that was. Um, Ariel Berger tells us that he read um, history through a literary lens. And there were a lot of Hasidic teachings, a lot of Hasidic stories, right? Um, and one of those teachings is that the world and texts are commentaries on each other. So most of the stories that he used in his courses and in his many courses were not really Holocaust related or stories about the Holocaust, except for maybe a few, but he, he used you know, a lot of, from you know, Rebbe Israel Baal Shem Tov and the Dybbuk and the Diary of Ian Frank and lots of other stories. So some Holocaust related, the majority not, but um, he really taught through stories. So my question is, what role do you think they play in Wiesel's methodology, what is, what is the importance of stories to him? And I'll, I'll throw two out together. And how are these stories related to moral education? And, and anything tonight that we ask or say, we ask of one another or say to one another, no right or wrong answers here. Like absolutely no right or wrong answers. So what do you think about all the storytelling that was described to us by Berger, who was more than a fly in the wall. He was a teaching assistant, but, but he had such a bird's eye view and, and took notes in real time, which was you know, such, so special to have that benefit. Um, what, what role do these stories play? I see Marcy, Marsha, is it Marcy um, or Marsha with your hand up? Right. Um, well, they were a tool to educate and um, it seems that one can um, learn, at least I can learn better through stories than just hearing very didactic statements about, um, about facts. And uh, it sort of reminds me of the old school of teaching of my parents' generation. So it reminds you of your parents' generation in the sense you, you think that, 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 that an older style of teaching was more story-based. Did I understand correctly? Great. Yes. Thank you, Marsha. Mm -hmm. so, um, less didactic, right? Um, what else? What are some other thoughts about this? I have some comments in the chat. Um, Linnea, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, says, I think we feel stories and they stay with us. Um, Deborah said, his stories are a lens to Europe prior to the Holocaust. And Dina said that um, he made students investigate new ways of thinking. So yeah, really interesting. So first of all, it's showing us a world, right? This, the stories that we're dealing with pre-Holocaust, it's showing us a world. Um, it, invest, it, it makes us investigate. I want to make sure I heard that last one correctly. It was in, I don't have the chat pulled up. Uh, Dean, are you willing to unmute and tell us more about that? And if not, no pressures. 
part of that path? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I think that he just had such integrity that, that he, he, as you say, he was a natural storyteller. And so he, he pulled people into the story and they became part of the story. It was a different way of, of teaching. Like the, he always said that he like asked questions in the beginning. It was like the story began in his classroom and he would say, okay, what questions do you have? And that's when it began, not what he decided before. Great, thank you. Um, so these stories really pulled people in. Uh, There's a comment from Barbara in the chat that says, um, we connect and identify with stories. It's hard to remember isolated names and dates. Stories stay with us. So Story. feel free people, um, attendees, to either raise your hand or use the participate hand. And actually we can have a conversation with the chat or outside of the chat. But if you prefer to talk, please feel free. Great, thank you. So, and so some of these comments are, are circling back to one another that we, we feel stories, right? They stay with us. We connect and identify with them. It's hard to remember facts and names, but we remember people's stories. So let's, let's relate this to moral education. What role, I, what's that? I saw a hand up with Mark. Do you want one more comment before you move on? <laughs> oh yeah, not, excuse me. Not and and um, I, I guess I was just so surprised that, and I don't know what I thought Ellie Wiesel was doing all these years, but to see him talking about Kafka and um, George Bernard Shaw and Hasidic tales and, oh my gosh, Dorfman and Toni Morrison. And like you say, Gail, kind of treating these stories all I don't know, in, in a single direction towards moral education, but I, I really admired that. And I think somebody said, you know, the taking notes, I was just so thrilled to see the bibliography at the end and kind of reading down like, which ones have I read? You know, what did, have I ever read Kierkegaard or, and so, but that was wonderful. It was just so broad and humane, uh, so. So Gail, I have two more. You can tell me when you're ready to cut it off, but um, oh, Beverly Stein well, would can like can to speak. Just, can I pause you just for one second? Mark? Sure. So Mark, I'm totally with you on that personally. And thank you for, for saying that. I, I felt similar as me um, in terms of seeing the breadth of thinkers that he was teaching in his classrooms and thinking to myself, wow, I kind of had maybe him pigeonholed in a certain way, right? I did not have a sense that he was getting into Kierkegaard and Kafka and Brecht and, and all of these thinkers in his classroom. So it was really cool just to see that. Marcy, share with us, thank you. Okay, so Beverly Stein would like to make a comment and then followed by Mary Larson. So I thought that stories was a technique to get the listener comfortable enough to make comment. Or if you start with these great novels or philosophy or data, then I could be wrong in what I say. But with the story, I'm reacting to something that's personal that would create something personal in me. So I thought it was an excellent technique as a teacher to get people generating conversation. And I thought he basically said that when he explained why he went into the Nagum, which he usually didn't do. And he said he felt the class didn't have enough emotional substance. And by bringing in a song, he felt he could touch a different part of the people in the room and create that conversation. Yeah, thank you. And, and to that point also, when sometimes language just has its limitations, you talked about the limitations of language and that something art, sometimes art and music can transcend that. And the Nagoon, the tune would allow that to happen also. And you, there was another comment. I, I know you were Mary, Mary Larson, hi, nice hi. to see you. Um, I was just going to say that um, stories take events that can happen in real life and sometimes do, but they present them in a way that we can observe and, um, and kind of discuss them without having the typical judgment that we might have if we actually discuss the event that had actually happened in real life. Hmm, interesting. Thank you. Any thoughts about that, anybody? 
That's, that's interesting. I'm going to think about that. And I know there's a comment in the chat from Linnea about stories reaching our vulnerable selves and reminding you of the quote from the book that vulnerability is the greatest weapon if you're brave enough to use it. Um, any, any thoughts on that quote from anyone? Was anyone, was that resonating with anyone? And, and it may be that we'll have thoughts in, in 10 minutes. So when you do, share them then. But any thoughts right now about that quote? So one thing we'll just, you know, just to stick for maybe another half minute on this idea of storytelling. When I was reading the book, um, it reminded me of the fact that night, which is, I, I'm sure everybody would agree, or most people, I should not say everybody, but most people would agree that that's really was a um, you know, ethical book, what he's most renowned for. Night opened with a story. It was a true story, but the first sentence in Night talks about Moshe the Beetle, which actually came up in Berger's book, Moshe the Beetle. Does anyone remember this from reading Night at all? And, and I'm wondering if anyone had a similar sense that I had, what, it was that, wow, the, um, I think the only time perhaps that Night told a story I mean, they told stories throughout about people that Rizal was coming into contact with in Auschwitz, but it opened not about him, not about his, his father or his mother or his sister, but it opened about this other person, Moshe the Beetle, with a story about something that happened uh, with this person coming back to their town. Um, anyway, let's let that marinate in our minds for a minute. Other, other thoughts about storytelling or, or its connection to um, the role it plays in moral education. And maybe we just wanna marinate with that too and, and um, dive into another aspect of this book. Well, there's something in the chat that actually might relate to your question on moral education from KK. Um, the comment is made, he was the person who warned everyone and no one believed him. That was Moshe the Beatle. Right. In fact, people thought that he was what? People thought he was crazy, right? So let's go right into there. I'm going to skip something. Let's go into madness. People, madness here is, is used in the book um, not as being angry, but as being insane, right? And this is a, a, a really big topic for Elie Wiesel, which I was unaware of, and much of his uh, work focused on that topic. He was really interested in it. I'm going to read you a couple of quotes. One is, um, madness holds the key to protest, to rebellion. Without it, if we are too sane by the standards of our surroundings, we can be carried along with the world's madness. And he also talked about, um, this is again, this is Berger quoting Elie Wiesel, that a madman can be a messenger who forces others to recognize evil. An outsider himself, he reminds others of their madness. This is why I study and I teach madness because only through recognizing its varieties can become sane. And he goes on a few sentences after that to say that this is the role of the witness. Now that was Moshe the Beetle, right? Moshe the Beetle was actually an outsider. Moshe the Beetle was Jewish, but Moshe the Beetle was not from Eli Wiesel's town of Seget. That's why he had been deported, witnessed and experienced things, managed to escape, and came back to Wiesel's town. But the reason he had been deported in the first place was that he did not hold citizenship. So comes back and everyone, and I'm, I'm, I'm going back and forth a little bit between Knight and this book, but Moshe the Beetle and Knight comes back, no one listened to him. He came back with a message, with a warning, right? There is evil out there, it's going to come and get us. And everyone thought he was insane. So. Wiesel spends much of the next 50, 60 years, right? Really dealing with this topic in some of his courses. What do you think about that? And what do you think about that? 
I have another question about this, but what, what do you think about that? Were you surprised that so much was devoted to this topic of madness? What did you, what did you, how did you experience reading about that through, through Berger's eyes? Uh, if I may use the, um, the mic rather than the chat because I have trouble typing it in. That's preferable, go for it. Oh, great. Well, I, I, I think it, uh, the, uh, not to harp on the obvious, but one of the most horrendous things, uh, aspects of the Holocaust was mm -hmm. that uh, any sane um, standards were, were, were uh, uh, totally destroyed. So the, the, the standards of, a, of, of an evil insane person, I don't even know if, if insane people can, can think up such horrors, although if you know the silence of the lamb, etc. But so, so I, that kind of inversion made it very clear after people realized what was going on that the Nazis had total control of reality. And that's a little abstract given uh, what was going on, but uh, it, it's one of the, the worst horrors. So I, I, can, I, I can understand why that caught um, Elie Wiesel's attention and Berger's attention. Um, and it, 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 it remains for us to think about that. So much of world news subsequently also Insane killing fields. What are you talking about? But there was a precedent for uh, 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 in the Holocaust. So uh, yeah, it makes perfectly good sense. It seems to me that uh, it's very sane to think about insanity. It's very. Thank you. That's interesting. That you put that, Emily. It's very sane to think about insanity. <clears throat> Other thoughts. So my dad, I, my parents were Holocaust survivors, and I think that the whole um, thinking style um, based on one growing up in that Europe, which we can never lose sight of, that was amazing and spiritual and cultural before the war, and then being thrown into that madness, as the other um, woman was saying, and then having to figure out sort of always watching and thinking constantly, because any fork in the road on any given day could be the difference between life and death. Now, how my dad translated this to us, of course, was we would be talking about something at dinner and he would only give so much information and then he would say, may his soul rest in peace, I can't paint that on your nose. Let's think about it. So in some way, I think that a lot of what Ellie Wiesel was doing through the book is some of that. So that's interesting. So when you say some of that, do you mean almost a um, sort of a cultural intellectual background? And um, whether it was teaching his uh, students, young people at Boston University or through this book written by one of his students to the audience us, he wanted us to do the same thing that my Dad, it's like I'm not painting it on your nose. Right. These are the things, and now you think about it, and hopefully you come to the and conclusion. And based on where, I mean, look at Rabbi Saxman's book, Moral. You know, may his soul rest in peace. It's so. Mm -hmm. It was relevant always, and it's even more relevant um, today. Thank you. And Darlene, you have your hand up, right? Yeah. So when I was reading the book and when he was talking about madness in the stories, it made me personally feel challenged because by, so now that there is madness in the world, so now where do I fit in the madness and what is my role when I'm faced with this madness? 
where do I fit in and what is my job? And that's where it kind of tied back to me to moral education. The, the questions are there, but in the it, it's one thing to know there's madness. And then there's a, the second step that she made me realize is acknowledgement of madness is only step one. What you do in the face of madness is what makes you a moral person. And whether it's your physical actions or your spiritual actions, that's the step that you need to take next. So that's what he made me question as I was mm -hmm. reading it. Thank you. Thank you, Darlene. Um, I'm, I'm checking the chat for a second. Uh, Mary's writing that it's interesting how people who continue to proclaim a message are often labeled as being mad or crazy. I really appreciated the quote. I continue to speak. It is not to change the world. It is so that they do not change me. Maybe people who seem mad tend to have the boldness to speak. Yeah, that is a great, a great quote, Mary. That is a really great quote. When, um, when Berger, at least, and again, this is all, you know, everything we're getting in this book about Ellie Wiesel is all mediated through Ariel Berger, right? And when Berger is presenting to us uh, this topic of, of, Wiesel's interest in madness and his, um, his, his sense of um, the connection of that to moral education. He's also talking about evil, right? So he's, he's we're, we're learning about Mephistopheles. I don't remember if I have the accent in the right place and how evil may appear disguised as good and to deny evil is as dangerous as to deny God. So um, he is challenging his students to always ask, where is Mephistopheles, right? And I, I, the chat is covering the name of the person who just spoke a minute ago uh, where you were saying um, you, you, your father said you, he couldn't paint it on your nose and, and that you were yes. asking some questions. And I think Darlene was also touching on this about asking, you know, where am I in all of this, right? What was yeah. asking? Wiesel was also inspiring his students to ask, where was who? Not just, not himself. Where was, where was God? God. Constantly asking, where was God in all of this? Who, where is evil? How is it showing up? Am I recognizing it, right? Am I recognizing it? So here's what I want you to think about for a second. Take a, take a few seconds to think about it. There is a quote about, um, evil existing in the participation of the reader. How, how can evil exist in the participation of the reader? Dina. So I, I was also struck by the, the collective political madness that he talks about, like fascism and communism and how how do we protect ourselves against this kind of madness? Because people got swept up by, by it. And he, um, you know, it's not just an abstract historical question is what he's saying. Right. He's totally saying that. He's totally saying that. How can we protect ourselves from that? How can we? So relate that to my question of how does evil exist in the participation of the reader? What thoughts do you have about that? Darlene. If we don't, if we don't, if we only recognize the evil, but we don't do anything about the evil, then we're allowing the evil. So we need to figure out how to stand against the evil to decrease the evil, it, it's, we have some role in, in whether the evil exists. Great, thank you. And he was to such a- Wiesel, To quote Ellie Wiesel, I need more. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's a, it's a, it, it's a great, it's a great point and a great comment, right? So how do we actually translate that knowing to, to doing, right? He was the perfect role model. Look at how he lived his life and was the first one to speak out 
when he saw that evil directed not just against Jews, but people, any people. He was one of the first people his whole life that spoke out. And it's interesting because I feel like people who went through those horrible, and again, I'm speaking from the reference of my uh, parents, especially my dad, um, they could turn inward and be bitter and, you know, try to forget about the evil, but so many um, live their lives the opposite of that. And I, I think that's what he's asking uh, us to do. Stand up, be a, be a, don't, you know, don't be a bystander. Okay. Great, thank you. And he's really, in, but, but if we want to distill even deeper in terms of his methodology as a teacher, and yes, I mean, I, I agree with everything that everyone is saying. I'm not, there, there are no right or wrong answers here. But it also, I, it struck me that he's, his methodology is to not give answers, right? His methodology is to inspire questions. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm curious for feedback. I'm reading this as my participation might be evil as a reader if I'm not questioning what I'm reading. If I'm not responding to what I'm reading with five questions that I didn't have before, am I participating in a, in a for the good way or for the evil way? I don't know. What are some thoughts you have about that? Gail, we have one comment in the chat from KK. Um, in all caps, protest against human suffering anywhere when there's nothing, when there's nothing else we can do. Right. Absolutely. Thank you. So, any thoughts about the role of the reader? When oh, Mark had a hand up as well. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I just wanted to say along those lines, Gail. I think he said that hate is not the opposite of love; it's apathy, and so to witness um, and not do anything, I think Deborah made this point pretty well. You know, that's that's evil. You know, and so that that made a big impression on me. Great, thank and you. Also, the yeah. indifference. I think that you know he speaks about like Kafka's, you know, from the trial. He talks about indifference, and. If you look away from suffering, then you become complicit in a bystander. If you look away from suffering, you, yes, you become complicit in a bystander. Thank you. And I saw a comment from John. Let me open my chat. I does, just... uh, yeah, the comment from John Davis, thank you, John, is does the reader acknowledge evil in others? I don't, John, what do you think? Does the reader? Tell us what you think. Anybody, what, what are your thoughts about that question? Does the reader acknowledge evil in others? Well, I was gonna say, I think um, the reader can acknowledge evil in others as well as in themselves. And I, I guess I was thinking back to where he discussed how the officers were often very kind to their families and kind to their animals and yet did these horrible, horrible things to people. And maybe part of it is recognizing that we we do all have an ability to do evil, whether it's by ignoring what's happening or by actually committing a crime or committing something, but that to recognize we, we could do something maybe so that we can somehow recognize that it can be stopped too, because if we can stop ourselves, perhaps there's a way to stop it elsewhere. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. And so when he's talking, when he being Berger, sharing with us uh, Wiesel's thoughts about, about madness, he, he goes into fanaticism um, as a type of madness, right? And I'm just going to read you something here. Um, this is quoting Ali Wiesel. Those who intend evil do not want others to ask these questions. And the bystanders who watch evil happening avoid such investigation. This is the front line of the battle against fanaticism. The fanatic believes he has all the answers and he has no questions. I have only questions. 
so I am their enemy. Questions can save us from the certainties that lead to fanaticism. To be human is to ask questions, to ask why, to inquire, to interrogate each situation in a search for the truth, the truth of how we must act. So I, I mean, I think it's like tying together everyone's comments, right? Tying it, so, so I, was, I was raising the issue of my role as a reader, if I'm not questioning, you know, when I'm reading, am I complicit in evil? And the comments that we were hearing about, how is this going to now translate into action, right? And I think that quote is really hitting on a lot of these comments sort of tying them together. Other thoughts about this? What are other thoughts you have about this? Dina Krauss, is that, are you raising your hand? No, <laughs> you're just looking no, at No, she's just, Fixing the camera. camera because my glasses are probably reflecting, right? <laughs> so um, I, I'm I'm cherry picking in my head other areas because I know we're not going to cover everything that I personally want to cover. So let's talk for a second about um, let's talk about memory since it's important that we make sure we do that. I think. Um, and if we don't get to everything else, at least we get to memories. So this wasn't one of my written down questions, but let me throw this out. Why do I think it's so important we talk about memory? Why, why is it so important to make sure that if we have to curate our topics tonight and edit them, that we don't leave memory out? Someone, what do you think? Dina Kaplan has a okay, hand Okay. Oh, Dina, Dina Krauss followed by Dina Kaplan. Go ahead. <laughs> um, there is no word in Hebrew for um, history. Uh, there's only the word for memory. Um, and I think that's very appropriate. Can, you tell, us, can you tell us more? Or, or... It's just... Um, the importance of words um, and translation and um, sure. the use of words. Okay, great, thank you. And then Dina Kaplan, and then I think there were a couple of other comments. If not, y'all. Connected to our humanity. It's connected to being a witness, that, that it's connected to witnessing others. That, that was just my thought. Okay, thank you. So it's connected to, to being a witness and to witnessing others. Yes, thank you. What else? Other thoughts? And if there are any voices that haven't come into the space yet tonight, we'd love to hear you. And Mark, that's okay. I saw your hand, go for it. <laughs> Did you I was, yeah, I was just coughing, but I, of course okay. I always have something to say. <laughs> The thing that made me uh, so happy and, and so connected was when he said over and over again that listening to a witness makes you a witness. And, you know, I'm, I'm not Jewish and, and I've, I have always struggled to feel like I share, I don't know, something of um, the shared experience. And that made me feel like as, as a witness or as a, a fellow human that I was somehow closer to Wiesel and to witnesses in general. And to witnesses in general, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's now your story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. It's now, it's now your story and it's now, what are you gonna do with it? That's and, right, and now I'm responsible too, mm -hmm. absolutely. Right, it draws it's and it's all these things we said tonight. Sorry, that's a beautiful comment, Mark. It really is. It is. Thank you. Who else? I, I oh. feel I relate. And so I'm going to participate for a second and jump out of my moderation role. But does that ever feel like a burden? That can be a burden. And I, I personally feel that sometimes. Tell us what you mean that can be a burden. You mean being a witness? Yeah, having a responsibility to, to tell truth, to, um, to be standing up all the time, to be calling things out. Maybe it's my position and where I sit in the museum, but it can get heavy. And I guess the question is, does anyone else ever feel that way? Yeah, Darlene. 
I, I want to talk about that because I think that for me, sometimes when you feel that the responsibility, you have to be doing something huge. And I don't know if you necessarily always have to be doing something huge or on a daily basis, you could just do something right and something nice and something that makes things better. You, I don't know if you can just like every day just change the world, but maybe you can relate it to another person in a way that makes their life better. It doesn't, I don't, I don't, I question whether it always has to be on the largest scale. If it couldn't be, I could more on a one-to-one -one smaller scale that just enough people do that and evil is challenged in its own way. And, and you know what? I think Berger actually touches on that topic toward the end of the book in terms of what Wiesel's expectations are for people, what they were for Berger specifically, right? I think he's actually bringing up that point that you're making here. I, I think it's a big burden if you feel like you have to do everything, but if you can do something, I think that's good. So um, lots of discussion in this book about memory, right? And um, that quote that Mark was sharing with us, certainly one of the quotes that Wiesel is most known for in his life. Um, and he talked about how he being Wiesel, that it was his quest uh, to make his memories redemptive. To make them uh, redemptive, and I, let me just check the chat really quickly. John is saying, our memories are a great part of our, oh, it's Maria, it's not John. Okay, hi, Maria. Memories are a great part of our existence. Yes, they are. And what, what, is it, what does it mean to you all to hear him say that his quest was to make his memories redempt redemptive. That's a very intentional word, right? Redemptive. And, and I'll, I'll say, he goes on the next page to say, my goal is always the same. And again, I'm quoting, this is Berger quoting Wiesel, right? So it's really Wiesel. My goal is always the same, to invoke the past as a shield for the future. And that meant, so he's talking about memory being our only protection. So he's using very intentional words. Memories are redemptive. Memories are our protection. What do you make of that? Marcia. Marcia. <clears throat> well, I think it's our responsibility to remember those memories and pass them on for generation to generation. And he, I think Ellie Wiesel, feels very strongly about these memories being forgotten and the only way they will be not forgotten is if we pass those memories on and of course act upon them in the best way we can which is living i think a, a good um a good life every day as someone else said uh it's hard to move the mountains but if you move the small stones you know um slowly you can maybe accomplish something great but the important thing is we cannot forget the catalyst for these memories so that's sort of my take it's elementary but it's true and as we listen to the holocaust survivor stories we realize they are far and few between and if we as uh, parents and grandparents don't pass these stories on um, Ellie Wiesel's fear might be realized, so we have to continue. Okay, thank you. Thoughts about Marcia's comment or other thoughts about memories being either protective or, or redemptive? I think I would agree with what Marcia said and also maybe add on to that, that, um, that to have huge suffering to want it to mean something and have value for the future is maybe partly redemptive also, makes it redemptive. I want, Mary, I wanna make sure I understood you correctly. Can I ask you to repeat that? Sure. Um, I guess I was saying that um, to have a painful memory and to have gone through something horrible, you don't want it to be for nothing. And so okay. you want it to be redemptive and have it have um, a purpose, maybe, or some good that comes out of it, perhaps. Right. Okay. Thank you. And I, Beverly, uh, Beverly, and then Dina, did you have a comment? So I think when he also talked about redemptive memory, it was not just 
to help what we as Jews have been through, but what's as an example of that memory for us to look at what's going on in other parts of the world and that some of those same things are happening in different ways, but similar ways, because he talked about the different hot areas that he had gone through and people that he had brought together to try and resolve conflict. And it takes that memory to spark in us when we read something in the news or we hear something that we need to step in and do something because we have the memory of what happened before and aware that it could happen again. Thank you. Other, other thoughts about this? Beverly, did you have a comment you were gonna make? That, that was Beverly that just shared. Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't see your mouth moving. Thoughts, other thoughts about this, anybody? Oh. Uh, Emily, and then I think I saw one other. I don't um, know, Emily, you're showing up twice on my screen. Yeah, oh, well, whatever. <laughs> oh, it's funny. Uh, Go. <laughs> let, me, let me just shut my that down. That oh, okay. thing, maybe that helps. Uh, so I want, I want, I'm like, oh, there are two comments. <laughs> I wanted to say two things, and it goes the reader's role. I mean, how the, the, the effect of reading uh, uh, material such as uh, about the Holocaust or about any atrocity, whether fictional or, uh, or um, historical. Uh, I think that one way we're connected in terms of evil, I would say, is that we're implicated because I, I think it's very hard to read anything like this and think, if not, if not uh, consciously, that uh, I'm human and human beings did this and uh, God only knows under what circumstances I might be capable of doing something like this. And if not doing the actual ev evil, then at least being uh, a bystander, which is, which is evil also. Mm -hmm. So I think, and also I think after I, I read th these things, I feel, uh, it happens more with the movies. I feel a little bit tainted because I've become, I, I, my face is put into it, uh, uh, into all the details. So being a witness, uh, you're, you're a witness at a cost because mm. you come so close uh, to evil. That's not to say that we shouldn't be witnesses. I'm just saying mm. that it's not this pure concept of, oh, well, I'm, I'm a witness or I'm just a witness. Um, and there's, it can be a burden sometimes too, right? And and therefore, uh, and, and the, the it also, right? It can also be uh, a burden. But uh, uh, regarding uh, burden, I would say, well, that's just too bad <laughs> because uh, I'm a child of survivors. Um, uh, uh, we we have to be, we have to we have to engage in the roles that we need to try to. Uh, diminish evil, and if that's a burden, well, that's the way it is. I, I, I you know, I, I don't, I wouldn't accept an excuse if somebody says, "Well, this is so hard, I can't do this." Mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't see it that way. Uh, and similarly, with thinking about all the evil and genocidal evil that that continues uh, in other uh, places uh, in the world. So, and and regarding history, I was just thinking that. Jewish tradition, and it comes out most explicitly in the Passover uh, Seder ceremony, where you're being invited and the children are being invited to uh, experience uh, the, uh, the descriptions in the Haggadah uh, as if you were there. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if, uh, and I'm, I, I'm fairly uh, traditional in my uh, practice uh, and thinking, um, I'm wondering, I never thought about this before, that maybe there is no separate word for history other than historia in, in Hebrew, uh, because maybe, maybe we're expected to have double vision and that we live in the present, of course, and we don't want to get stuck in the past. Uh, look what happened to Lot's wife. Uh, she turned into a, a pillar of, of stone by, by looking back, by a pillar of salt by looking back. Uh, but I once heard a, a psychiatrist at a, a conference, actually German psychiatrist, make this observation that you can turn into tears, you can turn into salt if you're always looking back. 
Nevertheless, I'm wondering if um, the Jewish way of looking at things uh, expects us to be on very intimate terms with history. So, so that, that, may, yeah. that is, was there another comment? Oh, Dina, you, you have to unmute. Dina Krauss, were you trying to speak? Not with history, but with memory. Tell us more. I, I just <laughs> feel that um, we are, if we are in touch with memory, with the memory of our forefathers, with the memories of um, the stories that are told, um, that's what we can carry with us. Uh, that's interesting. So I'm going to jump in, Gail, because I just looked at my phone and I was like, that back it's 7 50. we've got, about, yeah. we've got about 10 minutes left which i just wanted to give you a heads up thank you yeah i was just i was just glancing at that so um i'm going to tell you what we're not going to get to <laughs> um so and mark let's save that question it's a great question so i'm going to tell you uh because because i think some of these comments most recently in the last couple of minutes transition us really nicely to another area, which um, a lot of time was spent on in the book, was, which was the topic of despair, but also hope, right? So just to keep it in your head, here's what we're not going to cover tonight, all right? Um, I wanted to get into like this idea of otherness that he says, that Wiesel talks about that it fascinates him, right? And the notion of um, otherness and, and a helper against right, in our relationships with people. So we're probably not going to get there. And I was going to get into faith in a big way. We're probably not going to get there, unfortunately. I'll have to schedule another hour sometime. But let's, let's jump real quickly to the topic of despair and of hope. And, and then I want to throw out like a last question to y'all, because I do think that we've been spending all this time talking about Ellie Wiesel's wisdom, but we really need to talk about Ariel Berger a little bit. <laughs> so I do want to end um, trying to bring this back to Berger a little bit. So despair, hope, and we're just going to spend like two minutes because we do need some time to give ourselves to wrap up. So lots of quotes about despair and how Judaism looks at despair, right? And I think this really touches on what Emily was just talking about in some other comments. Um, to renounce despair is an act of will. The only way to be able to confront, to resist darkness. So he's talking about renouncing despair being an act of will. And then also, we're not going to get into doing a deep dive in faith, but that kind of language was used a lot in terms of faith. Faith being uh, an act of rebellion and resistance almost, right? Um, points out that my tradition, our tradition in this case, maybe not all of ours, but he was referring to Judaism, being filled with hope. I, I like to say sometimes that I think Jews are pathologically hopeful, <laughs> pathologically hopeful, right? Um, so how does this relate, this notion of despair and hope? And I'm only giving you a couple of the quotes. The book is full of them, this, this um, admonition all the time, don't give in to despair. But, so here's where, here's where we're gonna jump to later in the book, 50 pages later, Rizal says, I do not believe the world is learning. And yet, I do not believe in despair. So he's worrying that he's, he, we're learning about his efforts in terms of Rwanda in, in 1994, in, in Bosnia in the 90s, right? In Darfur. I don't think the world is learning, yet I'm not going to give in to despair. Let's take like maybe just a minute to talk about this, right? It deserves about 30. What are, what are a couple of comments you have about this? Because I, I do want to get the burger. I feel like I've got to. Anybody? And, and it, you know, maybe you don't and we'll jump to burger. That's fine too. I can't tell if I'm trying to switch pages here. Anyone anywhere have any comments about despair or hope or how you think that relates? So light overcomes darkness, KK is saying, hope is our friend. You should also look in, let me open the full chat. You should also look into the Persian Yalda and Hindu um, Purim, very similar cultures. Thank you. 
That is interesting to know. Thank you. So constantly, this constant admonition, exhortation, imploring, do not give up hope, right? Do not give in to despair. Do not give in to despair. Yeah. Then, question. yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Darlene. No, no, no. no. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. Oh, just very quickly, I, I love the emphasis on dancing and singing and laughter as ways to kind of get beyond despair. Great. I, I just can't imagine Ellie Wiesel laughing <laughs> at, a, at, a, at a joke or telling a joke, but it, it, uh, it's a kind oh. of anecdote, anecdote for despair, maybe. Yeah, and apparently... Oh, so Gail's frozen. Darlene, why don't you go ahead? I'm, I'm sure she'll come back. I don't want to monopolize. I just wanted to say that when he gave, and I may have, I hope I read it right. When he was able he to- a really good sense of humor. The difference between doubt and despair, like it's okay to doubt and to question without falling, without feeling that you're despairing. Because you don't have to like, I, I, I like the fact that he gave me permission to doubt and question it without feeling despair in the doubt. In, yes, and in that out was really helpful to me in today's world, that I could separate out the despair, despair from questioning and doubt. And in fact, am I frozen or can you hear me? You're okay. No, you're not frozen. Yeah, but in I'm gonna fact, add. doubt is actually a tool, right? Doubt is, is, is a tool that he uses. So I know we only have a couple of minutes. I'm gonna ask you to ask your last question. So my last, yes, my last question is, so Berger, um, you know, Berger opens this book talking about himself and his journey, right? He was, by the way, 15 years old when he met Ellie Wiesel. Not, am I frozen? No, you're okay. Oh, okay. Not uncoincidentally, Ellie Wiesel was 15 years old when he was with Auschwitz. Just wanted to point that out. Um, but he writes about his own journey and he all, but he also is writing about what is exceptional about Wiesel's teaching and his methodology and the usefulness of it and why it was even important to write a book about it. So what genre would you say this book falls into? What genre is Ariel Berger's book? We have like, like a minute. That. Okay, I used to run bookstores. <laughs> you did? Yeah, I did. And no. um, so I would have probably put this in um, uh, in history. Okay, in history. Mm -hmm. And it's it sometimes sometimes bookstores don't always have uh, a specific all, all yeah. the breakdown of what are considered literary genres. Also. Right. Right. So thank you. And if you want to think more expansively, other thoughts, well, let's just throw them out. What genre do you think this falls into? Is this, is this history? Is it, is it a biopic? Is it memoir? Is it straight nonfiction? Is it Dina's, Dina's shaking her head? No, 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 no. I'll tell you what I think, but I want to hear some other thoughts first. So we got someone in the chat that said philosophy. Philosophy, thank you. What else? Let's hear a few more. I'll add mine and then we're gonna we're gonna ramp up. Self-help. Ooh, what else? <laughs> I think this is me. This is not I mean, me as like a participant here. I think it's a coming of age book. I think it's a coming of age story of Ariel Berger. It just goes a little bit longer in the trajectory than many coming of age stories. I think it was his intellectual and emotional maturity. Um, but that's me. I'm not sure that any literary critic would, would say that. So uh, I, I, um, I just want to wrap up. I, uh, uh, Barbara Jo, oh, thank you. Um, we, we covered so much interesting stuff and there's so much left to cover. We could have talked for another hour about this book. Um, I really thank you for your time tonight. I'm going to turn it over to Marcy in a second because I know she wants to wrap up. But uh, Mark had this really interesting question before that I think it might be in the chat. And if you want to throw this into the, ch the chat while Marcy is closing, was, did anyone have a similar experience to Berger where there was a teacher in your life that had such an incredible 
um, influence on you, I think that's what Mark's question was, right? Um, that had such an incredible influence on you the way that Ellie Wiesel did on Ariel Berger. So throw that in the chat if you did have someone. And Marcy, if you- And yeah, I want to thank everyone for coming. I mean, it, this is maybe our fourth or fifth session. I can, I'm starting to see some of the same people month in and month out. So thank you and tell your friends. We are going to take the month of December off, assuming that um, it was going to be busy. Um, feel free to email me or drop me a note at the museum if, you know, with COVID and us staying home a bit more, you would value um, another book discussion because maybe we could add it back. We just made that assumption under the way we were living a week ago or two weeks ago. So open, open to adding one back if people feel like they have the time. Um, I quickly want to mention upcoming programs. We have one Thursday, November 19th called The Color of Law, A Forgotten History and How Our Government Segregated America. <laughs> and it will feature Richard Rothstein, who is um, the author of The Color, uh, the author of the, of the book and a fellow at the Economic Policy Institute Institute and a senior fellow at Thurgood Marshall Institute I, uh, and um, of the N NAACP Legal Defense Fund. I think it's going to be a um, very, very interesting conversation. I've heard, uh, he, I've heard Richard Rothstein. He's really worth it. Yeah, I mean, our registrations are well over 600 right now. I think it's going to be a stellar program. And then, you know, we have a virtual commemoration on remember, remembering the Holodomor commemorating the famine genocide in the Ukraine. So kind of back to our discussion of witness and um, memory um, that will take place that Sunday, November 22nd at three. I'll, of course, you probably all know you can register for any and all of our events on our events page where you registered, registered for this program. But um, thank you for coming. Thank you for the incredible conversation. Thank you to Gail for hosting and, and doing such an amazing job, both hosting and preparing. And I wish you all um, a, a happy, healthy um, Thanksgiving and you know the next few months as it maybe gets a little, as we head into winter.